Today we're reviewing the 14600K. Wait a minute, my comments or senses are tingling. Dude, if you're being sarcastic with your review of the new Intel processor, you should say so. People who aren't in your little clique and don't know if you're being serious or joking about the processor's performance. Ironically, I'm not sure if that commenter is being sarcastic or not, but just to make sure, you know, this is it's important to us. We would never, ever not review a CPU unseriously. That wouldn't be befitting of a CPU that CPUs as hard as a 14700K or a 14900K. I mean, dude, I feel so bad that I've possibly let you down and we want to make it up to everybody by taking this review of a very real and impactful product as seriously as we possibly can. We've put together this chart in hopes of bringing you only the most critical information right at the front of the review. We're not even putting it after the ad. This chart required hell-rending effort to put together, but we've done it. Our team spent countless hours counting the count of numbers in a CPU product name, and now, as we recount the act of counting the count not just once, nor twice, nay, but thrice, we can confidently state that our number counting methodology stands as the strongest counter-argument to the commenter's insinuation that we'd ever levy sarcasm to hold the product accountable. Now, if you don't trust our approach to this testing, our counting methodology is listed in the chart. As you can see in this painstakingly crafted chart, handmade by master chart craftsmen, Intel currently holds an impressive lead over AMD. Intel's best CPUs right now are all tied for chart leader, each containing six numbers. Now, you might be wondering why AMD isn't getting equal credit for six numbers in its name. And that's the secret. We realized while working on this chart that AMD's name contains an important factor, the X. Let's call it the X factor. I think that's trademark. Factor X. The X acts as a multiplier in these names. And so we took to it to do the hard work of multiplying these numbers out to see who truly wins in the chart. This is an innovation that Intel hasn't yet stumbled across. Multiplying out the name as instructed by the very name itself, something that somehow all reviewers overlooked, including us, we see that the 7800X3D becomes the AMD Ryzen 7 23400D, an epic CPU if we've ever seen one. AMD has 23400Ds, whereas Intel only has 14,900Ks. And that's in its best CPU. And we weren't sure which letter, D or K, is worth more here. So we looked up the frequency of occurrence in each letter in the English language. Our research indicates that the letter D occurs 4.3% of the time, whereas the letter K only appears 0.77% of the time. As you all know, 4.3% is 458.4% higher than 0.77%. We wanted to be fair, so we also spent time researching the occurrence interval of each letter as the first letter of a word in English. And D, once again, smashed it home. I hope we've made ourselves very clear as we go into this 14600K review. This is taken seriously. AMD has a lot more Ds than Intel has Ks. It's just not even close. Before that, this video is brought to you by Lian Lee and the O11D Evo XL. The O11D Evo XL builds upon the long-standing strengths of the O11D series by adding new features like a rotated GPU layout to showcase the most important part of a build. The Evo XL also uses a removable motherboard tray that can adjust for different heights, making it tunable for every style. Additionally, these cases use Lian Lee's compartmentalized approach to design to keep cables cleanly hidden behind the back of the case. Learn more at the link in the description below. In pseudo seriousness for you, we have a mix of things for you today. The first is a pretty straightforward review of the 14600K. That's the bulk of this video. We have all the charts. The second is some commentary on where the industry is right now and how this launch has sort of affected by sort of our perusing of comments online, the general perception of CPUs, GPUs, and excitement as a whole for PC building. And to kind of preempt the end of that statement that's coming up later, we do think actually there's a lot of things to be excited about in computer hardware right now. It's just not these CPUs. So cases and coolers have never been as good as they are now. And they're actually doing really sick stuff with some of the cooling technology now, even for air coolers, which is something you would think would be pretty stabilized at this point. Um, and likewise, the 7900XT dropping in price has taken something that at launch was disappointing and felt like just an upsell technique and it's made it actually 
viable and interesting. So there's cool stuff going on. A lot of it in the silicon world revolves around price drops, not new launches. These CPUs, though, are just kind of disappointing. But let's start with talking about the specs, and then we'll get into that discussion. First off, the specs are simple. So the 14600K is the same thing as the 13600K. The key differences are a 200 megahertz increase in max turbo frequency, a 100 megahertz increase in E-core max turbo, zero change to base frequency, but Intel spec website thinks it's different because they have an extra zero at the end of one of them for the 13600K, and the same goes for the E-core base frequency. Cache is identical, TDP is the same. Now let's go over the 14 series stuff. So this commenter actually gave a great launching point for some of the first part of this discussion. The commenter wrote, yeah, they said after the 13th release that the 14th gen will not be a generation upgrade and just a 13th gen refresh. That's why it has the same slot and everything almost the same. People just need to read. But it's normal for everyone on YouTube to make clickbaits and stuff for views. Nobody said that the 14th gen will be a leap, but views are views. This isn't obviously a commonly held sort of viewpoint uh, and, and not to denigrate it, but it does genuinely serve a good platform for sort of talking about that, which is the naming of things and the position of the CPUs. Intel did say it would be a leap. They didn't say it would be a, a massive game-changing one as far as I'm aware. I didn't read all the marketing for it, but that didn't seem to come up. So there's some truth to that, but not really. They did say it would be an improvement. And the more important factor is that there is an implicit improvement because there's a generational name increase and most people don't pay that close attention. So it starts to set this expectation for what is the product and what's it trying to do. And that's really the, that's how you set something up for disappointment. It's setting the expectation too high, which naming can very easily do in the hardware industry uh, we find this style of launch to be particularly bad because, and we've seen this a lot over the years, like the AMD XT series got the same treatment from us, uh, but we find it to be bad because of that sort of uh, unstable platform that they're establishing the expectations on. Now with the XT CPUs, AMD did one thing maybe better, which is they stuck with the same names and they appended something to them, so it doesn't appear... It, it, very clearly looks like a refresh, at least for people who pay attention, uh, as opposed to going to a whole new name or something. Although they've had their own faults in the past, like look at the FX series CPUs where a lot of them actually did get large increments in names, but no real baseline change to them. Uh, anyway, releasing a new CPU under the guise of a generational advancement when it plainly is not, uh, and is hardly even on par with the average overclock on the prior generation, just has the potential to be misleading at worst. The name matters. We said this about NVIDIA's GPUs too. One of the comments I made previously was about how uh, I didn't always have this viewpoint, but over time it's changed. And originally with NVIDIA's GPU naming, you know, people have complained for a couple generations now about it kind of shifting, right? So the high-end stuff is now more expensive and they've slotted in different names of things that are at the same price of the once high-end. And the original viewpoint was kind of like, well, I mean, the, the numbers are what the numbers are. Who really cares about the name? But over time, the name actually does in fact matter because it's sort of a death of the author situation, if you think about it that way, where the author releases something published to the world, and the world interprets it the way that the world wants to interpret it. Uh, you hit critical mass of a certain interpretation, that becomes the intended meaning, not the author's meaning. And that happens with names, where it becomes the customer's interpretation of the name that matters most. If the customer interprets it by historical naming practices to be a more significant change, then the performance needs to reflect that. Otherwise, they should call it a 13950K, a 13700KS or 750KS maybe because it's got the extra cores, 13600KS, something like that, 13650. Oh wait, I'm using the wrong names. Let's, no wait, those were right names. You, you see the problem here? Uh, otherwise, they could have just updated the 13th gen names by appending a digit or a letter or something to, to just make it clear it was a small refresh. And Intel's actually already done this. They did the 10850K previously when they launched a sort of refreshed, but actually clock reduced 10900K that was still a relevant chip rather than naming it something weird, like maybe making it the only 11th gen CPU and then skipping that one going to 12th with the next one. Uh, so we don't expect Intel to do nothing. At the same time, Intel's Arc GPU marketing team has shown some really good wherewithal 
for the most part, where uh, it's taking the approach of more modest updates and statements accompanying them, where when there's even massive driver changes, like 100% or whatever in some of these games in the past, they're not going out there and making claims that are any larger than the number of improvement, like percentage points wise, that it was. Arc is in that position because it's not the best and it has to prove itself. It has to be very careful of doing those types of things. Whereas the CPUs, Intel has proven itself in CPUs. It is very clearly a market leader. The 13900K is extremely powerful. Uh, and AMD is also a very close competitor now and is often better in a lot of cases, which is why it's all the more important for Intel to be more measured in its approach to things like product naming and releases in general. The gains we're seeing in this lineup, those are the ones I was seeing at sort of the start of my CPU reviewing tenure, where did you go on okay? So is it like always 3% per generation? Uh, and the answer of course is no. So that's sort of my commentary on just this launch in general, the industry, some thoughts for you. Uh, this is also me thinking out loud because coming out of three of these reviews now, we've recorded the other part of this already. Um, it always prompts some, some sort of internal discussion, some thinking, and okay, what does this all mean? And it doesn't affect the product, but it's kind of fun to talk about and think about how it affects us next time. Uh, as for what came out of this launch, the best things that came out of it were updated motherboards. If you're already buying an Intel CPU, so here's your buyer's advice before we even get into the review. Buy whichever one's cheaper, 13th gen or 14th gen. That's kind of the start and the end of it. 14700K, there's a little more to consider with production. We already talked about that. That's in that review. But for the most part, it doesn't really matter. And uh, the remaining 13 series CPUs, you have to factor in the new price, not the original MSRP. So we talked about this in the 147K review. Uh, but remember, it's not all performance. There's quality of life features too. Maybe you buy a higher end cooler so you can run the fan speeds lower. Things like that, that might matter to you in the long run. Our philosophy is to review things in the market they launch to. So we're not trying to make a uh, permanently standing review that can withstand the test of time because that's just not our philosophy for reviews. We view it as it needs to help the maximum amount of people right now when the product launches when the most of them are buying it. And so for that, we look at the pricing today. And the pricing today has the 13 series generally better value depending on which SKU than 14, which is kind of the crux of uh, the, the disappointment with the launch of 14 series. Now, as 13 goes away and you're forced to buy 14, okay, whatever, it's basically the same thing. You buy it in the same scenario as you would the 13. So that's sort of the positioning. Uh, also, it's still very power hungry. They could have done some more there, but at least the motherboards are better. Uh, anyway, quick recap here. 14600K is $330, whereas the 13600K is around 300 to 315, or an actually impressive 279 for the KF SKU after instant discounts. The 14600 KF is $304. Once again, that extra $25 is meaningful for a mid-range build on a budget, or you could just keep the money. But the performance change really doesn't matter that much. It's no different than when we said the 3600X was $50 for a letter. So our goal going into the commentary for this one was just to look at all the online discussion and the reviews where most people seem to be pretty aligned, like 99% or something, uh, and answer the question of, why does everyone feel this way? Like, let's try to put this into words to understand the situation a little better and uh, hopefully provide some context too for anyone at Intel marketing or whatever um, to, to maybe act on. All right, let's get into the review. Time to talk Intel's most feared subject, power consumption. As with the last two reviews, we'll start with a look at the generational power consumption by leveraging years of power logging data that we've collected in a like-for-like -like scenario. The 14600K pulled 173 watts in this test, and so continues Intel's trend of pushing power consumption through the roof. That an i5 CPU is now at 173 watts is actually insane, especially when we look back at the 9600K at a mere paltry 58 watts. Come on, Intel, it's about to be winter. We, we, we need more than that. That's not that we think Intel should keep the power that low every generation, but these leaps, the last couple specifically, have been massive. Cooling requirements are going up for anyone seeking full TVB under an all-core workload for CPUs that support thermal velocity boost. The 4690K was itself a refresh. I think it was called Devil's Canyon, so that... Pulling only 65 watts seems like a misnomer. The more modern architectures like Alder Lake's 12600K were still lower at around 118 watts or 125 watts 
for the 11600K. So the 14600K ends up more power hungry in our all core test than the 13600K is 161 watts as well. Now for the competitive power consumption, the 14600K is 173 watt result had it almost as power hungry as the 12 core 7800X in this all core workload. The 7700X ends up lower at 148 watts with the 5800X down at 127. Against the X3D CPUs, again looking at all core and not more variable gaming, which is lower for everyone, we see the 5600X3D at 74 watts, the 58X3D at 108 watts, and the 7800X3D at 86 watts. In terms of what that means for efficiency, we end up with this chart. This looks at a fixed unit of work, a render, and the time it took to complete that work to then calculate against the energy use during that time. The 14600K's 33.6 watt hour result has it only barely more efficient than the 14900K and less efficient than the 7700X at 31.1 watt hours. AMD has held an efficiency advantage in this calculation against all core blender work for a while now. All Intel is hoping to do is scale things back a little bit from those 13th gen numbers. But against the 13600K, the 14600K is less efficient. Intel's just blasting power to hit the clocks necessary to continue trying to compete at least without introducing a new architecture altogether. Rainbow Six Siege is up first. This one has scaled well in terms of game or external limitations, but it hasn't shown huge swings between the i9 and the i7 CPUs with the so-called 14th so-called gen, as we've said now. Here's the chart. The 14600K ran at 592 FPS average, which has it only 1.37% ahead of the 13600K. Intel, at this point, this is just sad. We're now three reviews deep in this product lineup, and we're still not seeing scaling. The 14,000 series is effectively a write-off. You only buy it if it's cheaper than the 13 series. The 14700K sometimes makes sense, but only really in production, and barely even then. The 14600K's positioning here means the 5600X is beaten by 11%, about the same as the 13600K led it previously. The 7600X leads the 14600K though, and by about 6%. It's not amazing, but at least there's differentiation. Let's move forward. F1 2023 is up next, updated from our F1 22 testing previously. The title's been extremely scalable once again for CPU reviews over the years, so it makes for a good benchmark. In F1 23 at 1080p, the 14600K ran at 356 FPS average, leading the 13600K by a measly 2%. It's really no difference, it's technically outside of error, but not outside of Intel's apathy to make a meaningful uplift, apparently. We're back to 11th generation behaviors from Intel as it scrambles to get more market against X3D. The 7600X leads the 14600K by 9% here, with the 14700K ahead by 17%. Although, if this kind of game is important to you, and if you're CPU limited, AMD is overall doing better in this title. The uplift against the 12600K is at least 22%, which isn't bad but the 13600K was already around 20% over it, so that's sort of the whole stagnation aspect. At 1440p, the 14600K ran at 350 FPS average. It's about the same as before, which is by design. We're CPU bound, even with the resolution bump. The 7700X remains ahead, and the 13600K is once again functionally tied here. We're just not seeing big differences with the 14600K. It's within error. If you're in the market for a new CPU and you wanted to consider this one, owning something at least like a 2700, something sufficiently old that you'd see an uplift is really the only main reason to buy this as an upgrade. But the problem is this is the same jump that you would have gotten with the 13600K's launch. So nothing's really moved. Baldur's Gate 3 is up next. We recently published a full deep dive piece on this one from a GPU perspective, but that also talked about how the game scales and how it behaves in different areas. It's kind of a study of the game. Our testing area is in Baldur's Gate City, as we found it to be one of the more representative areas of the game, and we've been excited to get this one into the CPU reviews because the game deserves the attention. At 1080p, the 14600K ran at 101 FPS average, with lows paced proportionally behind. It's in line with everything else here. That has it ahead of the 13600K by 3.3%. Once again, a breathtaking jaunt, at least this one is roughly two times higher than some of the other percentage increases we've seen. The 12600K is led by 22% here, 
And the 11, uh, wait, we, we, we don't talk about that one. AMD's most relevant alternatives include the 5800X 3D at 106 FPS average, about 5% ahead, and the 7800X 3D, which lately has been around $350 US, so it's super competitive with a lot of the high-end CPUs. That one is 20% ahead, and that is running at about 122 FPS average. At 1440p, things don't change much, but that's why we're happy about this test suite. It's well-tuned, it's a heavy CPU load, and that allows us the precision we need to see single-digit percentage increases in performance generationally. So, not really a generation, but anyway, this allows us to see some realistic use cases where you might play the game at a higher graphics quality as well, and you might still need a good CPU. Baldur's Gate is one that'll load the CPU prior to most modern high-end GPUs anyway, uh, but here it's about the same as we saw at 1080p, except for the very, very high end. Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty is also new to the suite. Regardless of Intel's performance here, we've liked adding this one back in for a few reasons. First of all, the game looks great, well, most of the time, and it utilizes GPUs and CPUs alike very heavily. It's not only GPU bound, despite the graphics focus, at least not unless ray tracing is on. There's also a setting in the options menu now for SMT and it properly functions. Our current understanding from CDPR is that it toggles SMT off to improve performance when above eight cores. This means AMD in particular sees uplift as compared to prior iterations of Cyberpunk where this was a more manual tuning process. At 1080p, the 14600K runs at 159 FPS average. It's definitely CPU bound on the 14.6 because the 7800X 2D establishes the ceiling at 203 FPS average minimally, leading the 14600K by 28%. Against the 13600K, this is a 1.8% uplift in performance. So once again, it's basically error. That's very nearly the same maximum variance we saw chip to chip in our sample size testing with 68 CPUs across two different vendors. And you should check out that sample size piece if you haven't yet, because it's pretty cool. It's just, it's kind of sad to see an entirely new CPU by name fall within that range. We're already on to Final Fantasy XIV. These charts are blowing by in the 14600K review. Typically, in Final Fantasy, Intel pulls ahead of the AMD CPUs. Some games just favor one architecture more than others. That's why, though, we have so many games in our test suite. At 1080p, the 14600K's 228 FPS average establishes at least a somewhat notable gap between it and the 13700K, which leads by 9%, and the 14700K at 12%. But we'd prefer to see something closer to those numbers as a gap against the 13600K. In this comparison, we're only seeing a 0.9% performance improvement as compared to the last generation's CPU of this name. That's just bafflingly bad for anything that has a new generational name strapped to the front of it. Intel should have just called these what they are. KS CPUs, or maybe a 13650K, or a 13800K for the 14.7 or something, but to try and iterate these by what a consumer would perceive as a meaningful generational change is just wasteful. People will expect more, and when they don't get it, they're going to be disappointed. At least setting the expectation better with a different name would help here. Plus, as we all know, numbers are finite. Once they're used, they're gone forever. What happens when we run out of numbers? Uh, no one knows but Intel wants to find out. Next one, Final Fantasy XIV at 1440p now. This is about the same. The 14600K was about four FPS ahead of the 13600K, so let's move on. Stellaris is up now. This is a simulation game where we benchmark by sim time, not by FPS. We've described this in the last couple reviews because these numbers make it interesting since it gives us another aspect of how a CPU can be useful in games. Simulation often doesn't land on the GPU for games, even though the graphics do. And if you haven't tried Stellaris, you really should. Add it to the list with Baldur's Gate 3. But as we said in the last two reviews, we're just not seeing scaling past 30 seconds simulation time for a year right now. We might need something more complex, we're looking into it, but our save game is already relatively late. For now at least, the CPUs in the range of 30 seconds and better are all functionally the same. You can't say any one of these is better than the next, because they're all within run-to-run -run variants or error of each other. And like we said last time, this time it isn't because of Intel's lack of innovation or change. It's just the limitation of the benchmark. Now for Starfield. Whatever you think of the game, its performance issues have made it at least a good benchmark. Bethesda has graced us with that much. 
It's one of the most expensive CPU and GPU benchmarks to have ever been made, and it was all by accident. At 1080p low, the 14600K ran at about 112 FPS average in our test scenario. The improvement is so impressively low that we wonder if Intel is actually trying to achieve a feat of the least improvement in a generation. In fact, it was so low that we had to use the decimal place in an attempt to extract any meaning from this. 1.4, by the way, is the amount of frames per second on average the 14600K improved over the 13.6. Something like a 14700K would get you an extra 13% in FPS, and the i7 and i9 SKUs are outperforming AMD's best here. But it's just that lack of scaling against the 13600K that sort of sucks the wind out of this launch. At 1080p high, the lineup is similar. We're still mostly CPU limited here. The 14600K's improvement is even more impressive now though than it was last time. 0.1 FPS average. Amazing. They've done it. The smallest improvement possible without being regressive like the 11th gen while still showing up on a chart truncated to one decimal place. We don't know what record Intel will set next, but we can definitely wait to see it. We're moving on to production benchmarks. This includes tests for Blender tile-based rendering for 3D modelers and animators in the audience, video editing and rendering testing for Adobe Premiere, benchmarks in Photoshop, compression, decompression, but we'll keep it as short as possible. This CPU is already predictable. Blender's first, the 14600K is 0.1 minutes, or about six seconds faster than the 13600K. Intel's 13600K already did fine in this test, considering its gaming focus, and the 14600K remains competitive against CPUs like the 7600X in this particular workload. But as an uplift, this is literally no different than if we just ran Blender again on our 13600K. One of those results would be the same as this one. We'll go a little faster and fly through them. Compression had the 14600K at 132,000 MIPS, an improvement of about 3% over the 13600K. At least it's something more. Decompression testing placed the 14600K 3.4% ahead of the 13600K. Another uninteresting change, but more than elsewhere. The 7700X is a strong alternative here. In Adobe Premiere, the 14600K's aggregate score was 747 points. That has it 3.6% ahead of the 13600K. So it appears that production benchmarks are consistently in the 3 to 4% range rather than the 1% to 2% of most games. Finally, Adobe Photoshop had the 14600K at 1426 points, or another 3.4% improvement over the 13600K. All right, so at the end of the day, the 14 series makes this feel like stagnation, but actually the industry is moving pretty fast right now in some aspects. So X3D has clearly taken everyone by surprise, including Intel here, uh, and that's, that's an exciting story arc. Arc GPUs are also very exciting from Intel. They're not quite there yet for a wide sweeping recommendation, but they're making big improvements and that's fun to, to kind of watch and for enthusiasts it might be fun to actually buy and use one of the cards. The 7900 XT just became a serious competitor with its price drop. And again, massive leaps in performance for chunks of metal like cases and coolers and feature improvements too. Mini ITX has never had this much attention and designs that are as good as they are today Keyboards are kind of in their prime and have built an entire enthusiast segment. The buyer's advice, once again, buy the cheaper one, 13600K, 14600K, whatever. If you don't need the IGP, you're not going to use it in something like QuickSync Adobe Premiere or something, then the KF model will save you even more money. Uh, and the, the 13600KF, depending on where you look, but where we saw it was about $25 cheaper than the 14600KF, and that's a pretty good buy right now if you're not doing something like a 5800X 3D. And then the 7800X3D, if you have a little more money, has been 350 to 400 lately. So that's a very strong competitor as well. Uh, but that's it for the review. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Check back for more content soon. And go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to support us directly or store.gamersnexus.net to buy one of our mod mats, toolkits, solder mats, or other items. We'll see you all next time.